who led us who led us to the uh, to see the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra, and I think it was Pizzarelli um, at the um, the Orpheum, if I'm not mistaken, and um, and then uh, we had uh, guests and uh, uh, conversation and some history afterwards. What a wonderful evening it was. Um, and so here we are again. We can't go to Israel to learn about the miraculous birth of the Israel Philharmonic. But what we can do is the next best thing. I can introduce our presenter tonight, Gord Cherry, professional trombonist, past member of the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra, a temple member, and so much more. I'll let him describe his many other achievements as he goes through his presentation tonight. And without further ado, over to you, Gord. Thanks so much, Larry. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thank you, David, for your tech help. It's, it's an honor to be here tonight to uh, tell everybody, my friends, my colleagues, uh, about this really fantastic story, the miracle of the Israel Philharmonic. I have a very great surprise for you. Later this evening, if it all works out, we are gonna have a special guest come on to speak with us. And that's all I'm gonna say. So you can let your imagination go wild. And we're, but right now we're gonna start with the miracle of the birth of the Israel Philharmonic. <clears throat> Okay, I've got to get my, there we go. And the man behind its creation, Bronislaw Huberman. We'll start in the present with a short performance of Johann Strauss Jr.'s Die Fledermaus Overture by the Israel Philharmonic and her former music director for life, Zubin Mehta. Meta was director of the ISO for an astounding 41 seasons from 1978 to 2019, one of the longest tenures in musical symphonic history. Okay, now let's just see if I can push this button here. Whoops. Here it is. <laughs> Thank you. 
William Michael Thompson. Okay, there we go. So that was a really great four spice or uh, introduction uh, appetizer to the evening. And now on to our adventure, the miracle of the Israel Philharmonic. The creation of the Palestine Symphony, which then became the Israel Philharmonic upon the creation of the state of Israel was born out of the passion and struggle of one man the great Polish Jewish violin virtuoso, Bronislaw Huberman. We will now learn more about him, his early years and his years of fame. Huberman used his talent, his fame, his determination and his political savvy to fight for the musicians and their families to escape the hate ridden Europe of the mid 1930s and bring them to Palestine to begin their lives and the new life of the Palestine Symphony. Huberman was born in Częstochowa, Poland. Well, that's where my grandmother, my maternal grandmother was born. He was born in 1882 to a poor Jewish family and he studied locally. And then at the Warsaw Conservatory, eventually at the age of 10, studying under the famous Joseph Joachim in Berlin. Their relationship was strained. And four years later, Huberman ended his formal studies on the violin. Jan Huberman began to concertize at age 11, pushed mercilessly by his hot-tempered father who had lost his teaching job and had decided that Bronislaw was the sole key to the financial success of the family. If you look carefully at the uh, photo on the left, uh, that's not a real beach. It's a studio where you went if you didn't have a lot of money and they had a bit of sand on the floor and uh, a picture on the wall, a mural of the sea and you got to pose with whomever you wanted, uh, you know, for a Kopeck or whatever. And those are pictures of him as probably 10, 12 years old. In 1896, at the age of 13, Huberman before, performed the violin concerto of Johannes Brahms in Vienna in the presence of the composer himself, who was stunned by the quality of his playing at so young an age. Brahms wrote a congratulatory note, which became a keepsake of Huberman, and it was passed down through the family and was recently auctioned. Here is the note. And those of you who are familiar with the Brahms Violin Concerto and can read music, you will see that those first two bars are from the second movement. <laughs> beautiful melody performed by the solo oboe. And uh, Brahms writes not only the little melody, but a little note to Huberman, uh, putting the date on it of uh, February 1980, 1996, not too long after Brahms passed away. Huberman toured Europe and North America in the 20s and the 30s, becoming recognized as one of the world's greatest violinists. However, his fame has always been overshadowed by Yasha Heifetz and Fritz Kreisler for a number of reasons. Here is a sample of his playing from 1925, the Carmen Fantasy by Sarasate. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so that gives you an idea of uh, his mastery of the violin and his great artistry. And of course, that Carmen Fantasy uh, are a series of variations for violin and piano and or, and or orchestra uh, from the opera, the great opera by Georges Bizet, uh, the Frenchman, and uh, Sarasate arranged that and it became its own masterpiece. Now, a failed marriage to German actress Elsa Galafez bore a son, Johannes. Well, guess what? Johannes married Barbara Pentland, a very, very well-known BC and Canadian composer, and lived in Vancouver until his death in 1996. And although I don't remember meeting Johannes uh, Huberman, I'm sure he attended many concerts that... Uh, I was performing at. The horrors of World War I shocked Huberman to his core and made him see the darker truth of his fellow man. It humanized him. After a lifetime of shelter, touring with his father, living the life of an artist, only concerned with his own career and concertizing, Huberman was aroused with a searing political consciousness that would be a major focus for the rest of his life. Huberman, who was tormented by the loss of life in World War I, made a huge discovery, an epiphany, that the hidden link between his artistic side and his political side was that the true artist does not create art as an end in itself. He creates art for human beings. Humanity is the goal. What a great, great thought. Huberman, being kindled by his new passion, abruptly canceled all concerts for two years and in 1922 began studying at the Sorbonne in Paris, embracing the pan-European movement, which called for the political and economic union of the European states in the hope of preventing another war. He and other intellectuals, such as Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud, also promoted this idea. But just 15 years later, the Nazis would shatter this dream when they began hostilities towards their neighbors. Now imagine having a career and just giving it up totally for an idea that you had about pan-European, Europeanism. In 1929, Huberman first visited Palestine as an artist and became passionate with a vision of establishing classical music in the Holy Land. He was touched by the exuberance of the audiences who had music running in their blood and were starved for music. It was during, excuse me, it was during this 1929 visit to Palestine that, her, that Huberman became enthralled with Zionism. Maybe it was here he found the family he didn't have. After a quick rise in popularity beginning in the 1920s, Adolf Hitler was elected in 1923 as chancellor and soon with his Nazi party and the support of millions of citizens began the stranglehold of Germany's Jewish citizens that took away their freedoms, their spirits, their jobs, and eventually their lives. The right-hand picture shows Hitler being congratulated 
by the outgoing Chancellor Bismarck. Oh no, sorry, Hindenburg, Hindenburg, Chancellor Hindenburg. And if I'm correct, Hindenburg passed away suddenly only a few days after this photo was taken. Hundreds of Jewish German musicians found themselves out of work. They had been members of the greatest orchestras in the world, including the Berlin Philharmonic under the direction of their maestro, Wilhelm Furtwängler. Furtwängler claimed to be an advocate of his Jewish colleagues, but he stayed in Germany right through to the end of the war. Furtwängler would struggle with his decision for the rest of his life. You can go on to YouTube and you can listen to Furtwängler and the Berlin Philharmonic performing some of Wagner's works. Uh, that is the photo on the right with the swastika. And uh, it's, 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 it's sort of stomach churning when, when you watch and listen to it. And this is one of the reasons, and we'll get into this later, maybe if some of you have questions as to why the Israel Philharmonic does not perform the music of Wagner. Wilhelm Friedweingler made a deal with the devil. Josef Goebbels, Reich Minister of Propaganda, who promised the conductor funding for his orchestra and a promise to go easy on key Jewish members if Friedweingler decided to stay and conduct in Germany. By 1935, the Berlin Philharmonic was without any Jews. One of the so many broken promises. Huberman was one of the first persons to recognize the extreme danger to Jews of remaining in Germany. He had a sense of the horrors that were to occur in the future, and unfortunately, he was right. He wrote a letter to his colleague, Wilhelm Furtwängler, head of the Berlin Philharmonic, promptly canceling all of his concerts in Germany until conditions for Jews were normalized. Huberman went public by saying he was an enemy of Nazism. Huberman met Eba Ibiken, a nurse at the treatment center he went to for emotional distress. Uh, Huberman had a delicate temperament and he came close to having nervous breakdowns a few times during his life. Huberman and Ida had a very close bond and remained together until his death. She was his nurse, secretary, housekeeper, love of his life, a true partner in every sense. In 1934, Huberman returned to Palestine to present a recital tour to the culture-starved audiences who promptly bought up every ticket for all 12 concerts. When finding out that many could not afford the prices, Huberman offered to perform reduced rate worker concerts as well. He fell in love with Palestine and at the same time saw the extraordinary opportunity to add to the local culture by giving Palestine a first-class orchestra and saving Jews from the coming tragedy which he foresaw in Europe. This idea became the passion of his life for the next two years. So this wasn't the first time that Huberman put, Huberman put everything down and stopped his career to take on a passion. The creation of an orchestra in Palestine would be like a fist against Nazism and would build prestige around the world for Jews and their nascent nation. Arturo Toscanini, at the time the most renowned conductor in the world, was also distraught and furious with Hitler's cultural philosophies and was an ardent anti-fascist. After refusing an invitation to conduct at the world famous Wagner Bayreuth Festival, Hitler himself wrote a letter asking the maestro Toscanini to reconsider. Toscanini held fast to his beliefs and refused to conduct writing a letter made public to the world. Huberman read Toscanini's letter and quickly wrote to him with his idea to form a world-class symphony orchestra in Palestine made up of exiled Jewish musicians from Europe. Toscanini replied to the affirmative 
and Huberman traveled to Italy to meet with the maestro. Toscanini agreed to conduct the opening concerts of the new Palestine Orchestra, a huge coup for Huberman's idea. Huberman was ecstatic and immediately started making plans. Now, by the way, Toscanini took no, he took no fees for this. And to think that back in those days when uh, travel was so much more inhibited than it is now, of course we have COVID, but uh, to think that he could get Toscanini to fly halfway around the world to a desert to conduct musicians that he had no idea how they performed. This was really something incredible. Huberman spent the next two years of his life auditioning hundreds of musicians from all over Europe, not just Germany. At first, there wasn't much interest in moving to the desert, but as Hitler's evil closed in, Huberman became deluged with requests. Realistically, he knew there would be physical, political, and financial limits to the numbers he could accept. But 80 to 85 was his working number plus families. He could only accept the best musicians. He knew what lay ahead for those who didn't make it into the orchestra. Huberman knew many of the musicians from Poland, his birthplace. So in fairness, he held blind auditions selection to the new orchestra would be based solely on the quality of the musicianship. The Ginsburg family, for instance, had four members who made the grade. Horst Solomon, principal horn of the Berlin Philharmonic, now he's the horn player, the fifth horn player over on the right, um, he had been fired. And as well, he was a world-class weightlifter and was not allowed to compete in the Berlin Olympics. Lauren Fenivesh, a young Hungarian violinist auditioned in Budapest for Huberman. His career eventually took him to Palestine, Israel, Switzerland, and then to Toronto, where he eventually settled with his family, teaching at the Faculty of Music of the University of Toronto as the esteemed professor of violin. In early 1936, Huberman worked with an increasing fervor knowing that the deadline for the orchestra's first concert in October was approaching and that conditions for European Jews were rapidly deteriorating. Just when Huberman was stepping into high gear, several things happened that added roadblocks in front of his dream of creating a new orchestra in Palestine. Number one, Kurt Singer, a charismatic Berlin physician, choral conductor and cultural icon, ramped up the Jüdischer Kulturbund, a cultural federation of over 1300 Jewish artists who were fired from German cultural institutions and were desperate for work. Singer made a deal with the Nazis to allow Jewish artists to produce Jewish only productions, secretly hoping to outlive the Nazi regime. Tragically, most of these artists eventually were sent to their deaths, including Singer. Huberman contacted William Steinberg, the out of work conductor of the Frankfurt Symphony and asked him to prepare the future orchestra for two months in advance of the arrival of Toscanini. Many of you might not know this, but uh, William Steinberg went on to become the conductor of the Pittsburgh Symphony and also was the principal conductor of the New York Philharmonic for uh, a couple of years. He was a really great musician, a great artist. I didn't get a chance to perform for him, but I have numerous colleagues who talked about his greatness. Number two, the next phase, the next problem was money. Huberman needed a lot of it and the world was still suffering from the effects of the depression. Against all odds, Huberman put his solo career on hold and launched the Palestine Symphony fundraising tour throughout North America, performing, performing 42 benefit concerts in 60 days. He twisted arms, gave speeches, wrote articles, gave dinners and talked to everyone he could think of 
calling in all the connections he had made in his distinguished solo career. He enlisted heavy hitters like Albert Einstein, the world's most famous Jew. He became a statesman. His partner, Ida, was very worried about what the stress would do to his health. He gave a Carnegie Hall solo recital to raise money with a symphony orchestra. At that very concert, his prized Stradivarius was tragically stolen from his dressing room while he was on stage performing with his other violin, the Guarneri. He never saw that violin again, but miraculously, it appeared over 50, 60 years later. That instrument, known as the Gibson Huberman Strad, is now owned by Joshua Bell, another famous Jewish violinist. Another lecture possibility for sure. Uh, this violin was painted black after it was stolen and its owner played on it for 50, 60 years until he died. He confessed, the, he confessed his sin to his wife on his deathbed, whereupon she contacted the authorities and they cleaned up the violin and put it on the market. Josh Bell walked into his favorite violin shop in London and there was this pristine Strad and he walked up to it and played and he said it was love at first sight and he started playing it. That's the violin that he played the soundtrack for the red violin on the movie. And there is another documentary out called The Black Violin, which tells the story of the stolen violin. Here is the ad for the stolen Stradivarius telling everybody where they can look under the left S curve for the inside the violin. If you shine a light in there, it would say Antonius Stradivarius, 1713. Just a moment, okay. A gala Einstein dinner raised the balance of the money Huberman needed to fund the orchestra for its first season and also to bring the musicians over with their families. It was a lot of money. But then there was a third unexpected disaster. Arab violence from within Palestine caused by Jewish immigration threatened the whole project. Now, for those of you who may not know, after World War I, Britain and the Allies divided up the conquered territories of the uh, the German and Turkish Empire, and the Turkish uh, the Turkish government uh, was basically in charge of the entire Middle East, and they carved up the Allies, the Middle East, into all of these new countries. One of them was called Palestine, and Britain was given the mandate for Palestine, and. Part of the history of Palestine was that the uh, early Jewish settlers who were coming in from Europe to escape the uh, increasing uh, stranglehold uh, that the Nazis were putting on the Jews in Europe, the, the British government who had the mandate over Palestine had a very strict number of immigrants, Jewish immigrants they could let into Palestine. Part of this was pressure that the Arab population and Arab nations around Palestine were putting on Britain. As the World War II was approaching, Britain knew it needed huge amounts of oil. Britain had no oil. They had to secure oil, which was liquid gold at the time. They knew they could not fight the Second World War with Hitler and win unless they had huge amounts of oil. So they made a deal with the Arab nations to curb the amount of Jews allowed into Palestine. And when anytime uh, a, 
uh, a group of Jews came into uh, Palestine, there was violence because the, the Arab uh, people did not want it. So Herbermann was urged to postpone or even cancel his plans after this violence, and he was close to a nervous breakdown. I thought I'd give you a little bit of that background. And of course, if you know the story of the book uh, Exodus by Leon Uris, that tells the story of Jews trying to enter the mandate uh, occupied uh, Palestine, um, which at the time was illegal. Toscanini graciously agreed to a two month postponement of the concerts until the end of December, until Huberman could raise more money uh, for getting the immigrants out of Israel and to get these immigration visas. The postponement was a two edged sword. The extra time was putting pressure on the musicians, many of whom had no income and in some cases, no roof over their heads for themselves and their families. Plus, there was the added danger of the musicians staying any longer in Europe with quickly deteriorating conditions. But the two added months gave more time to audition the final musicians for the orchestra and get the precious visas from the British authorities who were masters of the immigration to Palestine. Due to many pressures, there were strict quotas on the number of Jews entering Palestine. And I think I'm remembering here to uh, remember the story about the Exodus novel. Number four, Huberman's plans then ran into an immigration snag with the Jewish agency headed up by David Ben-Gurion. The needed visas for these musicians also needed to be approved by Ben-Gurion and the Jewish agency. While the Jewish agency needed workers and fighters for the future state of Israel, not Huberman's fancy musicians, whom they thought would return to Europe after the tensions were over, wasting these precious visas guardedly held by the British. The Jewish agency would only agree to temporary visas for the musicians. Huberman, not one to quit, had an ace up his sleeve. He went to a higher authority than Ben-Gurion, Dr. Chaim Weizmann, president of the World Zionist Conference, a man who had helped the British win the First World War. He was a scientist, uh, a chemist. He invented the chemical needed to make high explosives, TNT. Weizmann went to everyone he could think of in the British Home Office to have them issue permanent visas to the musicians to enter Palestine. After months of silence on August 11, 1936, the visas eventually arrived and the musicians could now travel to Palestine. In late October, the musicians arrived by steamer in Haifa. The musicians were bused to Tel Aviv where they moved into their new lodgings with their families. Plus, they had to learn a new language. In early November, two months of daily rehearsals led by Steinberg began in earnest for preparation of the first concert on December 26, 1936. The two months delay meant that the weather was cooler, but a lot wetter. Can you just give me two minutes and I'll be right back. Sorry for the delay.
I'm back, thank you. So, the weather was a lot cooler. The concert hall was actually the Levant Pavilion, a dilapidated exhibition hall that leaked like a sieve onto the musicians and their instruments. The leaks were plugged, but it was unpleasant because of the incessant noise of the rain and banging from the renovations needed on the building. Renovations took place after hours in order to keep the rehearsals noise-free after an outburst from Steinberg at a rehearsal where the musicians just could not practice because of all the noise going on from the workers. These musicians were amongst the finest musicians in Europe. A third of them were first chair players who didn't come all the way to a dusty outpost in the middle of the desert to play so-called backstand second fiddle. Now, by the way, Lauren Fennivesh, that I, who I talked about earlier, there he is on the far right playing in the violin section. Hoberman insisted on the creation of a school of music along with the orchestra so the talent of the musicians with their teaching could plant seeds amongst the Palestine youth for the future. That idea to this day has contributed greatly to the culture of Israel. Toscanini's arrival on December 20th was like the coming of the Messiah. The anticipation of the first concert with him conducting had been building for months. Tens of thousands of music starved residents were trying to get their hands on 3000 tickets for the opening concert. After 60 rehearsals with the new orchestra, Steinberg handed over his baton to Maestro Toscanini, who without uttering more than two words, and I'll tell you what those two words were. He said, Il Brahms, which means the Brahms. He took the orchestra through the entire first movement of the Brahms Second Symphony without stopping. Here's a poster for the concert, which included a Rossini Overture, Brahms Symphony Number no. 2, Schubert Unfinished Symphony, the um, Mendelssohn music uh, from Midsummer's Night Dream, a Weber Overture, probably Oberon, and more. It was a great concert, and Huberman refused to play as soloist, even though he was requested. But both he and Toscanini wanted the orchestra to be the star of the night. After years of planning, frustration, auditions, politics, wrangling, stress, fundraising, and more endured by Huberman, the orchestra was ready to perform its first concert with Maestro Toscanini. The concert was a smashing success. The orchestra played at a level unheard of in most orchestras of the world at the time. The audience went wild with enthusiasm. It was a cultural earthquake. Here is a very rare but poor quality clip of an excerpt from the Schubert Unfinished Symphony from that very first concert. Oops, let me see where it is here. It's down at the bottom. Ah, yeah, here it is. <laughs>
there you go. Beautiful horn playing by Mr. Shapiro and also beautiful oboe playing. And you know, Tusk, just a little aside, people criticize Toscanini for having fast tempos. That was not a fast tempo. That was a very, very relaxed, subdued tempo from the Schubert Unfinished Symphony. The success of the initial concert was like a delirium and the mood could not be described in words. The concert was the talk of the town for many days. People would recall their feelings about it years later as one of the great joys of their lives. It was a triumph for all. An orchestra of exiled Jews performing at a very high level would send a clarion call to the world to raise a fist against anti-Semitism, fighting Nazism with the only weapon they had, their music. The concert was broadcast and heard by millions around the world. The orchestra continued to perform a series of concerts for about a week, ending in January the 5th. Now began the concerts presented in Jerusalem and Haifa that Huberman was really excited about, the ones for the workers and soldiers that he had promised. Within eight, within eight days of concerts, more than 15,000 people had heard the orchestra. Toscanini returned once again in 1939 for a repeat set of performances, this time with Huberman as soloist. And this is a little bit of trivia. If you take a look at the center of the photo, and you see the podium at the front of the stage. There is a figure there with her arms clasped together. And of course, even though you can't see it very clearly, that is the image of Golda Meir, who eventually became the prime minister of Israel. She was there right from the beginning. Upon founding of the state of Israel in 1948, the orchestra changed its name to the Israel Philharmonic. One of its first conductors was the young Leonard Bernstein. He conducted dozens of times in the future years. Here are the maestros who were major conductors of the orchestra since 1936. William Steinberg, Paul Perret, Bernardino Molinari, John Martineau, Leonard Bernstein who became their laureate conductor and Zubin Mehta, who was appointed its first music director in 1977, and then music director for life in 1981, stepping down just recently in 2019. The new music director of the IPO is Lahav Shaini. The IPO records, tours internationally, and is recognized as one of the leading orchestras in the world. The Israel Philharmonic was planning to come to Vancouver in 2020, but the COVID pandemic has put that on hold. The Israel Philharmonic did come to visit Vancouver, Vancouver in 1985, maybe 86, uh, with Meta conducting. And that was a really great occasion. To conclude, Here's a video of the Israel Philharmonic from 1988 performing the Hatikva, which means the hope, conducted by the music director for life, Zubin Mehta. This is Israel's national anthem, Hatikva.
Okay, there we go. Gordon, your surprise guest has arrived. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, uh, how about if we if I introduce our surprise guest and we'll let him speak. Are you going to take care of that for me, David? Yes, he is unmuted. Good evening, everyone. Um, am I now really being heard? What, yeah. a, what an extraordinary occasion, first of all, to meet you all. Second of all, to remember some of these uh, figures from Israel, because uh, some of those people that we saw in the early pictures of the Palestine Orchestra were still members of the Israel Philharmonic when I joined the orchestra in late 1950. Um, the, Israel was a very young country. There was an extraordinary euphoria. You can imagine the feeling in that nation that was just emerging and suddenly had, a, had been granted statehood and the orchestra was a symbol of everything that Israel was trying to do. It was said that uh, the prime minister, taxi drivers and members of the Israel Philharmonic were the most prestigious members of Israeli society in that era of 1950, right after the nation was founded. I joined the orchestra very, very early in its existence, and it was a chaotic orchestra. It was an orchestra uh, lacking the kind of discipline we hope for and know about in modern uh, major symphony orchestras. But uh, imagine, if you can, an orchestra with concert masters from 12 or 13 major European centers, each vying for the leading position. One of the concert masters was Ginsburg. We mentioned, uh, Ginsburg was mentioned earlier. He was one of four brothers. Three of them were triplets. One played the trumpet, one was the concert master, the violinist, and one played the timpani. And the discipline of that orchestra was so astonishingly uh, unusual, let's say, that on occasions when the Ginsburg brothers arrived at rehearsal, they would change positions and the poor conductor would give a downbeat and there'd be this extraordinary cacophony from the timpani or a violin sound that was never meant to be sound or sounded or a trumpet desperately being blown by a timpani player. It was an astonishing era. It was a crazy orchestra and we thrived on it. Uh, there was a book written called Gods, Geniuses and People. The gods were the conductors, the geniuses were the guest soloists, and the people were the poor members of the orchestra. I arrived in Israel, uh, I was able to take a, a car with me. I had, I had a, yeah. Could I just ask you to introduce yourself, your connection to Gordon and your connection to the Israeli program? I, I should be delighted to. I thought that Gordon had introduced me. Oh. I apologize for not. Actually, I, I didn't introduce you uh, ahead of time. I kept you a secret, but I'll introduce you first and then you can go ahead. Go ahead, please. Hoover in the uh, 50s and became the principal conduct a uh, principal view, uh, bassoonist of the Vancouver Symphony and also the CBC Radio Orchestra or the Vancouver Radio Orchestra conducted by John Avison. And uh, George played with the orchestra for many, many seasons and eventually became orchestra. He's uh, one of our the gems uh, in Vancouver and uh, I'm so glad that he could come and that the word got out to him that I was putting this uh, presentation on. Go ahead, George. 
Thank you for the introduction. Well, actually, this leads right into a, a, a little story. I arrived in Israel aboard the Kedma, which was an old converted uh, Liberty boat, a freighter without any stabilizers. And it, it was, uh, Kedma means forward. And it was a, a ship full of immigrants and full of new people taking Aliyah and arriving in Israel for jobs as I was coming. And of course, the nation was so new that the immigration officers did not yet have uniforms. And they just stood behind wooden trestle tables and they inspected everybody's passport and their baggage. I came up with my passport and uh, a contract to play with the Israel Philharmonic. And uh, the customs officer looked at it. And in the tradition of customs officers around the world, he looked at the passport suspiciously, handed it to another one who also looked at it equally suspiciously. Neither of them said a single word. They passed the passport down the line to someone in a glass booth at the end. And somebody came along and said, please follow me. So I thought I was going to be sent back on the Kedma to be seasick for another four days. But instead, I was taken into a little room where I was introduced in perfectly fluent English to the director of immigration. He said, good afternoon and welcome to Israel. And he took out a bottle of schnapps and poured me a drink and said, we want to greet you. So I said, did they do this for every new arrival who comes to the country? And then he said, he lowered his voice and he said, by the way, I hear you're coming to play with the Philharmonic. I said, yes, I'm due at a rehearsal the day after tomorrow. He said, do you think you can get me some tickets for Thursday night's concert? I learned in the first 24 hours in Israel what it meant to have protectia, because the symphony was so well respected and so well liked that the orchestra uh, could did almost do anything they wanted. And having tickets for a concert was what the most precious thing you could imagine. We played in a hall in Tel Aviv called the Ohel Shem, uh, which uh, all the English speaking people call the hell of a shame, of course. And it was an old British concert hut with a metal roof. And on either side of the building were four story concrete block apartment buildings. In one on the third floor lived a Romanian family with a child who had very serious child colic and who cried endlessly. And one morning during rehearsal, the child began his interminable, interminable crying. And the mother did what any mother does when there's too much noise. She started banging on the roof of the concert hut with a hammer. And of course it was the din absolutely blocked out all sound and the conductor had to call an intermission. And immediately somebody called the prime minister's office. That was how important the symphony was in those days. And uh, the prime minister was not free, but he sent the cabinet secretary who came down. They had a conference on stage. They literally found the family another apartment so that she could move. A moving truck turned up. This is all during the intermission while they, uh, on stage they had these high level negotiations. And within two hours, the orchestra was playing again and no interruptions from hammers on the roof. It was an astonishing time. We went, the hall was so small, we had to play 11 times in Tel Aviv, seven times in a movie theater in Haifa, and five times every concert in Jerusalem. It was a wild season of touring, endlessly moving from one town to another on uh, roads that were not, not like the, the super highways of today, you would drive to Jerusalem on a two-lane windy highway with the ruins of, of uh, burnt out tanks and uh, uh, ammunition vehicles on all sides where the war had recently been concluded. But the orchestra had this power to uh, dominate every situation. Wherever we came, the audiences were extraordinarily warm and uh, just loved the opportunity to hear the music. Uh, it was a good orchestra, but as I said, it was an undisciplined orchestra. And it was uh, Horst Solomon, who you mentioned in the earlier part, he was the horn player from Berlin, the former wrestler or weightlifter. Uh, he was the orchestra inspector 
and he uh, tried desperately to maintain discipline, but with rehearsals conducted in eight different languages and uh, everybody demanding their own way, it was a very hard first year musically, but what an opportunity to play with such, such players and such an introduction to professional life. Um, one of the uh, stories that uh, Gordon probably knows more about than I do, uh, our trombonist was a chap by the name of Bernie Schneider. He was a very fine player and he later became the principal, uh, uh, principal trombonist of the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra under George Sell. And uh, Bernie lived with us in the Bet Tismoret. It was a house of a, 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 an Italian uh, quant a building, a, a prefabricated uh, housing built for the visiting uh, guest, art visiting artists like myself, members of the orchestra. It was motel style with a common, uh, common toilets and common kitchens down the end. And Bernie, who lived in one room by himself, uh, on weekends used to uh, gather players from the orchestra and go and play on kibbutzim where he would play for uh, parties and for weddings and for various ceremonies with a little Dixieland band. Now the fees, the salaries paid for kibbutz events were very strange. An ordinary party you would come home with a basket full of green peppers and onions but a wedding, now that was special. And on one night, Bernie came home from a wedding after two o'clock in the morning with a live chicken. And that was the big event of the day. He threw it over the transom into the common kitchen. And of course, none of us knew how to slaughter it or there was no shakit around. And we desperately tried to figure out what to do. We finally got an Arab neighbor to perform the grisly task for us. We uh, lived on that chicken for weeks because there was uh, our lifetime in Israel was torn between the two important uh, activities. One was playing in the orchestra and the other was finding food to survive because it was a time of extreme austerity. And uh, Bernie, who had been there six months more than I had, uh, told us that he knew of a black market joint in Herzliya, about 20 kilometers north of Tel Aviv, where you guaranteed you could get a schnitzel. Of course, this was unheard of because there was no meat on the market. We had ration cards, but our ration cards didn't always provide any of the things that it listed because they had to find the supplies. So uh, we were gonna go to this uh, black market restaurant. It was like uh, uh, the, pro the promised land in the promised land. And uh, we went there and of course they thought we were police informers. So we were given the regular menu, menu, which was nothing more than frozen cod from Iceland. That was all that the restaurants had in those days. And after about the fifth time, we were finally able to get a schnitzel. They came out of the steaming out of the kitchen. And as we were just about ready to uh, enjoy it, there's a hammering at the door and the schnitzel police arrived. Uh, trench coats and fedora hats, exactly as one would expect. And they started ticketing everyone and the restaurant, the waiters grabbed the plates and took them backstage and other people put them under their tables. And some people escaped through the back door, but uh, the, uh, the, the waiter, the, the hotel, the restaurant proprietors obviously expected this and probably anticipated an annual uh, expense of paying off the police because they, they disappeared shortly and our schnitzels returned. By the way, they were pork schnitzels. I hate to tell you this, so it was all, all sorts. Of, that was one of the sort of things. We, we lived so much by uh, looking for food. It was really a, a, a debilitating activity because we really would rather have been playing music and being more concentrated on, on the glories of the orchestra. It was an incredible orchestra, but uh, uh, the um, one day, I told you, I mentioned we played in the, in the, in the OSM and these uh, 
I, mean, I, I told the story of the, the lady who banged on the roof and uh, demanded that, that they stop the rehearsal. And finally, the prime minister sent somebody from his office and they very carefully arranged to find another apartment for her. That was the sort of thing that happened all the time. It was an orchestra of such uh, power and it was the, the opportunity to uh, uh, get my first really proper professional experience with it in the presence of such players was really something very, very special. When I left Israel, uh, I gave my credit, my uh, um, ration card to the oboe player who uh, at that time was still the second oboist of the orchestra. I gave him also my tailcoat, which I had bought on somewhere in New York on West 49th Street, and it was still very good material. And three years later, when the orchestra came on tour, I went down to Seattle, actually, to hear them play on one of their North American tours. And he was still wearing the same. He was now principal oboe. And he said, good material. I've still been playing it, wearing it for three years. It's uh, a wonderful link with the past of this orchestra. What a time it was. And I would love to be able to go again. And obviously, I'm not tra able to travel these days so much. but. Uh, it was a time of great excitement and great belief that music could become a bridge between societies and cultures and give us all the opportunity to express ourselves powerfully and equally across the world. Perhaps you have some questions. I try to remember from my experiences. It's a long time ago, but uh, the orchestra has a much greater tenacity than I do, I think. George, these are fantastic stories and recollections that you have. I really appreciate that. I think now what we should do is maybe have David uh, read some questions out to the two of us and um, we can answer them. I'm sorry if some of you had sound problems. I'm just reading the chats now and I don't know what the problem was because it seemed that David and I had it uh, going pretty well. And so I apologize for any sound problems. Of course, we're up at the cabin here, but we do have good internet tonight. Anyway, uh, David, um, why don't you read some questions out? Well, Gordon, I, I think I have a, a, another surprise guest. I'm told that we have oh. Carl Lieberman, who's a past member of the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra, has joined us today. Fantastic. I don't know if she wants to say a few words or not. Um, How do we do that? Well, just talk. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, this, this is fantastic. I never expected anything so wonderful. Uh, I played in the IPO from 1967 to 1990. Uh, 69. I came in August right after the Six Day War, and it was two of the best years of my life. Uh, Subin Mehta was the uh, principal conductor, and Leonard Bernstein came many times, and Abado, and I can't tell you how many conductors, and it was a fabulous experience and a wonderful orchestra, and it still is. And where are you speaking from, Carol? I'm speaking from Brookline, Massachusetts. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. So we do have some. That's where I live. All right. Um, we do have some questions. Um, there's so many comments. I have. John Hawkins asked if uh, there was efforts uh, to bring Jewish and non-Jewish uh, musicians to Israel uh, out of war-torn or the similar situations. And that's directed to Gordon or if anybody else knows and wants to chime in. Well, of course, the Second World War was the primary reason and Nazism why the Israel Philharmonic was founded. Uh, after communist 
uh, Russia started putting the clamps on Jews who wanted to leave the Soviet Union, there was uh, a great number of Soviet, especially string players, who had great talents and came to Israel. And a, a lot of the orchestra, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, but the string section really benefited by the incredible talent of some of those who came from the Soviet Union. So that was something that happened in more modern times in the 70s and 80s, when over a million uh, Jews from the Soviet Union uh, immigrated to uh, Medalia to Israel. Uh, an interesting story is one of my very good friends, Charlie Butler, a trumpeter with the Seattle Symphony. He played for several years with the Israel Philharmonic. And for years, I didn't know that Charlie Butler was actually a, a Navajo Indian. And Charlie thinks he's the only Navajo in the world who can speak Hebrew. And uh, Charlie still leaves, lives in Seattle. So there were some non uh, Jews who played in the Israel Philharmonic, but I, I'd say it was uh, a real, um, there, there was, it, it was not a requirement, but let's just say it was, it seemed natural that Jewish musicians, if they came to Israel, um, you know, would, would want to get in the Israel Philharmonic. Another question that came in is that a few years ago, Daniel Birnbaum conducted a Wagner concert in Jerusalem, angering many survivors who left the hotel in protest. Your thoughts, Gordon? Let's, let's have both George and I speak about this. All right. George, you need to unmute yourself. There he goes. Go ahead, George. Uh, my, my memory is not of playing Wagner, but of the first time the Israel Philharmonic played Richard Strauss, which was equally uh, problematic in the early times. But uh, we had a visit. We, uh, there was a conductor by the name of, who actually should have been mentioned. He was one of the regular conductors in the early days, Igor Markevich, who came frequently and uh, the orchestra was constantly under guest conductors. There was no permanent conductor in the early days. But uh, the conductors came, of course, and they chose their own program, or they hoped they could chose, choose their own program. And I remember the occasion when the first uh, we played uh, Heldenleben, the very first time. And I thought it was not a particularly uh, sensitive choice of, of piece for the, uh, given the, uh, the atmosphere, they could have perhaps chosen something else. But uh, the music itself, overcame the resistance. Of course, and every, every political move in the music world is going to be challenged on one side or another. There are going to be uh, different views. And uh, Barenboim, of course, did it, I think, deliberately once he had an opportunity to put an orchestra on. It was his, uh, the mixed orchestra, which was a, a very successful venture at the time, but he probably chose deliberately to show that he could do that. But uh, in the, the days of uh, in 1951 and two, Richard Strauss had literally not, not been played in the last 10 years in Palestine. And so it was a musical experience. It was an epiphany for us musically because we all wanted to make it sound as wonderfully rich as possible. And in general, my impression was that the audience uh, approved the, the press. The next morning uh, was, I remember, was basically in support and enthusiastic that the barrier had been broken without offense to anybody. Thank you, George. I'll talk about Wagner. Wagner was an ardent anti-Semite. He wrote two essays called The Jew in Music. One was written a little bit earlier in his career when he was not a superstar and he put that under a pseudonym and it came out in a German music magazine. His theory was Jews could not perform German music or compose music as Germans and really sound like true German music. And he used the uh, example of Mendelssohn. 
and he used some words um, comparing the sound of Yiddish uh, as a guttural language, gross, distorted. And this is what Jewish music, this is what German music sounded like when it was composed by Jews. Well, of course, this erupted in Germany because many of the German uh, uh, music lovers in Germany and musicians were horrified by this, but there was also an, an incredible amount of anti-Semitism that went on in the late 1800s. Later on, when Wagner was a superstar, he published the, basically the same essay, uh, the, the Jew in Music, and he put his name on it. And so Wagner wasn't a Nazi, but Hitler and the Nazi party used Wagner's music as propaganda to further their goals. And because of this, Wagner's music is perpetually uh, branded as music that was sanctioned by the Nazi party. There's, it's part of history. There's no getting away from it. When the Israel Philharmonic uh, was founded, there was uh, a decision that was made by the orchestra that the music of Wagner was never to be performed. As George mentioned, years later, Daniel Berenbaum made a decision to perform uh, Wagner. He, he went to the orchestra. There was a great amount of teeth gnashing and emotions, as you can imagine. And what eventually came out was that Berenbaum would conduct uh, the piece uh, Siegfried Edel, which is one of the most peaceful sounding pieces that Wagner ever wrote. It was a present to his newborn son, Siegfried, uh, that was performed as a, as a gift uh, by musicians that Wagner brought into his home after his wife gave birth. Siegfried Edel has no political background in it, whatever. It's just a beautiful, lovely piece of music. And on top of that, the musicians of the orchestra who felt that they could not, uh, for, for emotional or political reasons, perform this music were allowed uh, a, a, um, a pass uh, with full pay and did not have to play uh, on that piece or that concert, I'm not sure exact details. And that's the history of the first performance of Wagner in Israel. I'm not even sure it was done at a main series concert. Uh, since that time, I cannot tell you with any authority whether Wagner, uh, especially from his, uh, the ring cycle, uh, whether any of that music has been performed. Um, the famous Ride of the Valkyrie was used by the Nazis as sort of a war march. And uh, so this, this composer, Wagner, uh, was uh, considered a, a very, very hot potato like kryptonite in Israel. I want to tell you just a little side story. About 35 years ago, Wagner's grandson, uh, I think it was Christoph, uh, came to Vancouver to give a lecture. And he was the president of the, oh, I knew I was going to forget this, uh, the Jewish composer who uh, composed, uh, German composer, uh, do -do -do -do, do -do -do -do. Uh, Kurt Weil. Kurt Weil. Kurt Weil. Uh, Wagner's grandson became the president of the Kurt Weil Society. And he gave a lecture about the anti-Semitism in the Wagner family. And he was the black sheep, nobody talked to him. And this was in the 1980s. So even going a hundred years past the life of Wagner, the family still harbored uh, extreme views of Nazism and anti-Semitism. So there's a little bit of history about Wagner in the Israel Philharmonic. Of course, it goes deeper than that, but um, this is uh, a little bit of the details. 
Uh, Gordon, there's another little detail that came in. Elizabeth Rom has written, uh, George uh, Zuckerman came on tour with us as the soloist in the Atlantic Symphony many years ago. Great bassoon player and so much fun. That's great. And, uh, and that Carol Lieberman, who spoke to us earlier, was an icon violinist when I studied in Boston um, Anna Elliott uh, Goldschmidt and writes to the group. I, I would I would love to speak with her, but I can't seem to uh, I can't seem to email her here. Oh Hi, well. Carol. At Hi, the Carol. bottom of the, at the Hi. bottom. Oh, there, there you are. <laughs> We've been in the dark, but we're just loving this. Jerry is standing. <laughs> And we're just loving every second. You guys, what an amazing uh, night. And George, hello. Hello, and Jerry, everyone. So Thank you. <laughs> it's great. Carol, you, you great really, to see everybody. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, Carol, when I was in school at Boston University, I was studying with Jan Polsky there. You and, yeah. and was it Mark Nykrug? Mark no, no. Kroll. Mark Kroll, yes. Um, yes. Yes. You two were like the the big. You were actually at the at the forefront of the Baroque performance practice, right? That's of, right. Of well, he's been my husband for almost fifty years. Well, good for you. <laughs> my God, good for him. And, you know, this is amazing. But you you were such a huge um, part of my life, and and oh, a I'm hero. so glad. A, a brilliant woman violinist, right? And so, anyway, I just wanted to let you know thank that you were a huge part of my life. And thank you Thank for you. That. It's wonderful to see you. <laughs> so lovely. And I'll get in touch with you. I'll, I'll find a way to do that. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you guys Bye. for everything. What an, what an amazing night. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and Elizabeth Rahm, for those of you who don't know who Elizabeth Rahm is, she's one of our brilliant Canadian composers. You you all should know that. Um, hello, Elizabeth. And thank you for everything you do for music in Canada. And you're, or, or, or is it is Elizabeth? Yes. Elizabeth, or is it a, your daughter? Oh, my gosh. I know. I'm, you see, this is my age showing her up. Her daughter is Erica. And Erica is yeah, a yes, yes, yes. violinist. Brilliant. Thank brilliant. You. She's probably closer to my age, but yes. So, <laughs> but Elizabeth's an amazing composer, beautiful composer. So Google, Google Elizabeth Rahm's music, you guys. Elizabeth loves writing for brass instruments and I have the honor of being able to publish uh, many of her compositions for the brass instruments. And her daughter, Erica is an equally brilliant musician and her husband, uh, Dick Rom is a trombonist, and we all attended, uh, along with my wife Joyce, we all attended the Eastman School of Music together. So there is a real connection here going on tonight. And I just wanted to say hi to Jerry Stanick. I haven't seen you for many years. Jerry is an iconic hero uh, in the string world in Canada and uh, taught hundreds of musicians at, uh, all over Canada. Hi, Jerry. Say hello to your daughter. Rebecca, she... I will. Thank you. Yes. yes. <laughs> she's coming. She's coming up to the cabin. You can see we're up at the cabin. We got all these huge trees behind us. She'll be up here with our granddaughter finally after almost two years uh, to visit. Yes. Thank you so much for this. You're welcome. We have a, Sean has rephrased his question or wants me to rephrase it. It was about today. Is the Israeli Philharmonic uh, and Israel paying it forward? Are they involved in rescuing musicians? I don't, I don't really know enough about that. I don't think so. I, th I think the Israel Philharmonic's main job is to you know, promote great music, uh, not only in Israel, but they around the world. They tour a lot. When things get going again, 
they'll be on tour probably 15 weeks a year. That or things about being in the Israel Philharmonic is is the touring. Uh, touring is 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 a double-edged sword. It's it's great to perform in all these different halls to international audiences, but uh, it is it is really taxing uh, on everybody. And uh, but Israel Philharmonic does it more than just about any orchestra, and I hope they can come here soon. But I don't know anything about them rescuing, you know, Jewish musicians from the rest of the world. I haven't heard anything about that. Gordon, I have a question about uh, the Russian uh, influx to Israel. Lots of musicians, I suspect, came in there. Absolutely. Uh, of the one million uh, Soviet Jews who came into Israel, I'd say 900,000 of them were musicians. <laughs> and uh, almost 100% of them were violinists. <laughs> Definitely. And, <laughs> and, and of course, others came uh, to the rest of the world in Vancouver. Uh, we had three musicians. Uh, we had uh, Roma Machikov. We had um, uh, the cellist Eugene Osaji uh, uh, and his uh, his wife at the time, uh, Natasha, uh, who's now married to my uh, dear colleague Doug Sparks. So we had three musicians who came into the Vancouver Symphony in the 1980s, and every orchestra in North America uh, was uh, taken on by these incredibly talented musicians, especially the, uh, the string players. They came from the studios of Rostropovich and David Oistrach and uh, their style and, and talent was, uh, was almost unmatched. Um, Anna Elliott Goldsmith writes in, my teacher, Victor Gampolsky, uh, became, she was her teacher and was the second violin of the Boston Symphony. Right, right. And we yeah. also, he also has written in, and the Russian musicians who were not carrying a violin were the pianists. Absolutely, absolutely. The pianists, yeah. So uh, I don't know what else I can uh, add to this, but uh, oh, I should re recommend. There is a video that uh, all of you could get at the, at the library. It's called Orchestra of Exiles. I should have so-called written it down. There's also a book. The Waldman Library, the Waldman Library or the Vancouver Public Library? You can get it at any major orchestra, at any major, any major public library. It was put out about 20 years ago. It's called Orchestra of Exiles. And it's about 90 minutes long. And it tells in minute detail with about 20 times as many pictures as I gave you tonight, uh, ev all the details of this ma magnificent story and the heroic efforts of Huberman. Um, you know, Huberman's career was just a tiny bit too early for him to become a superstar. Many of you probably hadn't heard of him, whereas, uh, you know, uh, some of the superstars uh, like um, Heifetz, uh, they were a little bit later and the recordings were more advanced and they were on LPs, 33s. And uh, whereas Huberman, most of his recordings do not exist anymore except on scratchy 78s. And so unfortunately his, uh, his talents did not he wasn't able to shine the same way as some of the others. Yeah. Gord, I'm going to, uh, it's Larry Bloom here. I'm going to uh, hop in here now. What an amazing evening. I'm in the company of virtuosos, <laughs> geniuses. I mean, this has been just such a special evening. Um, and, and I got to hear Hatikva and what a version. I don't hear Hatikva that much anymore. Growing up as, uh, as a young boy in Hamilton, I would hear it often, but um, not anymore. And that was so nice. Um, I should mention, um, as we wrap it up, that uh, uh, the men's club opens these presentations to everyone. 
as I believe we should, not just Temple Shalom members. And so you may, you will find yourself on our mailing list. We, um, uh, we only mail out, uh, uh, you know, little blurbs about upcoming presentations. They only come out about once a month. If you don't want to be on that mailing list for presentations like this, no problem at all. Please just send us an email. Please remove me from the list and we will. If you'd like to stay on it for presentations like this in the future, that is even better. Um, Gordon and George and Carol and everyone tonight, especially Gordon, thank you so much for your time, your, your wonderful presentation, um, your stories. Uh, very, very special. This has been an incredible evening. Um, and thank you to everyone who participated and registered tonight. Uh, we wish you the best. Please stay safe, stay well and uh, hopefully see you next month. Thank you, Gord. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, David, for all your help and for sponsoring this, this evening. I really had a great time, and what a special treat to have Carol and George Thanks. on, along with uh, Jerry Stanek and, uh, and, Betsy and Betsy Rom and so many of my friends and colleagues. Thank you for coming, and for Temple Shalom members, that's our spiritual home for the last 40 plus years. Thank you so much and have a great evening. And thanks, I can see all of your comments and chats. Thanks so much for your kind words. Stay safe, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Lord.